Hello, esteemed attendees. Hello to our viewers, everyone watching us today on the online platforms. Good afternoon, Alexander Ivanovich. Good afternoon. Your shows are quite popular. We are working hard, doing our best. We have covered a couple of topics together, or rather more, within one large presentation. So, what brings you here today? I think it's time to talk about the main symbol of the U.S. moon program, the Saturn V rocket. We haven't touched on it yet, as it was methodologically easier to start with the spacecraft. So today, I think we'll talk about the rocket. Go ahead, the floor is yours. So, one of my first articles on this topic was titled, Everything Starts with a Rocket. Indeed, when did we first think about launching a satellite? After the successful test of Coral Yov's R7. And then came the turn for manned missions, and the space era began. But everything starts with a rocket. The topic I announced is called, What's Wrong with the American Moon Rocket? And indeed, there is something wrong. I formulated my theme as follows, Saturn V, Apollo 11, meaning that the Saturn V rocket, which was involved in launching Apollo 11, was a ballistic unmanned missile that ended its journey in the Atlantic Ocean. My entire story will be dedicated to substantiating this claim. Let's dive straight into July 16, 1969. The globally promoted and announced launch of Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were supposedly going to land on the moon. The weather that day is important. Notice the clear skies, the shadows of people are clearly visible, but the sky is slightly covered by a nearly transparent haze. This haze will play an important role in my story. These are the stands for the press and VIPs. At the launch, there were 3,500 American and foreign print, TV, and radio journalists. The launch was widely covered. Here's another shot. The stands are not far behind us. A view of the launching Apollo, which is on the left of the frame. The distance to the launch site is 5 kilometers. This is also an important figure. It's significant because, from a distance of 5 kilometers, you won't see any important details. You can see a mass of people surrounding the area outside the stands. According to publicists, several hundred thousand people came to witness the spectacle of the first moon launch. Tens of thousands were likely allowed into the vicinity of the launch site. We'll discuss that number too. And again, the sky is clear. Now I want to demonstrate an interesting phenomenon that will be discussed throughout my presentation. Occasionally, though not uniquely, this phenomenon occurs when there is a cloudy haze. The rocket passes through this haze, and a shadow from the rocket forms on top of the haze. Since the haze is semi-transparent, the shadow is also visible from below. Right now, we are watching the launch of a more modern Atlas V rocket. 
We see the formation of the shadow. It moves across the clouds. It seems that the person filming this clip liked it. Now, please play the clip. Let's watch how this shadow quickly flashes by, and we'll analyze the situation. There it is, appearing and rushing forward. There will be a replay. Here's another replay of the same shot. Thank you. Please, hold that frame. That's it, we don't need this clip anymore. We should clearly understand this phenomenon. It's shown here on the slide. We see a rocket that has passed through a thin, semi-transparent cloud layer, punching a hole in it. The rocket will fly upward, and the shadow from the rocket will run, in this case, to the left. The shadow is clearly visible from the ground. We will now observe this hole and shadow for Saturn V. So, let's return to the launching area, back to July 16. Saturn V is on the launch pad. The height of the rocket is 100 meters. This is an important figure, which will also be useful. We see light clouds in the sky. This is the ignition moment. A few more seconds, and the rocket will take off. Let's watch the clip, created from NASA footage. Please note, this is slow motion playback. Now, it will be sped up. So, the playback speed changes arbitrarily here. Did you see the shadow just now? Yes, let's replay that episode. There's the shadow, there's the hole. That's it, thank you. Here's this shot, so we can examine it slowly. I must say that NASA tried not to publicize this phenomenon in their films. The thing is, it provides quite interesting information about the rocket, primarily about its speed. We all see that the shadow is moving because the rocket is moving. If the rocket moves quickly, the shadow will move quickly. In general, if you link these phenomena, you can determine the speed of the rocket, and this is an inspection method. Up until 2020, we watched many professional films created from NASA footage, and we didn't see this phenomenon being shown. But when this phenomenon gradually began to interest critics based on other videos, NASA published these videos. As you can see, everything is clearly visible here. One thing is missing, there is no flight altitude and no flight time, which makes this video essentially an episode for a feature film and useless for analysis. We need a clip that shows the rocket's ascent without editing. So, I'm not criticizing the previous film. It's artistic and everything is beautifully shown. But for analysis, we need an unedited video with a timer. 
If such a clip exists, we will be able to determine the rocket's flight altitude, speed, and even calculate its energy characteristics. And we will be able to compare that with what the moon rocket should achieve. Alexander Ivanovich, let's try to clarify once more. The NASA footage we've just seen, does not allow for the calculations you're talking about, as the presented footage contains numerous cuts, and it's impossible to track the flight from the moment of launch to the moment it passes through the clouds, punching the hole. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. Thank you for pointing that out, it's important. We searched for such a clip for a long time. We didn't find it in NASA's materials. But in 2009, on the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission, an American named Philip Frank Palacia uploaded a unique video in this regard. A few words about this author, as it helps to understand his motivation. He was a senior manager at IBM working on contracts with NASA for the Apollo program and other space programs. So, he had no interest in deliberately discrediting NASA's information. For his successful work on these programs, he was invited to attend the Apollo 11 launch. He filmed it from a distance of one mile. This is also significant, because an amateur camera is worse than a professional one. But most people observed from five kilometers away, and thanks to the close distance, he achieved a resolution close to professional quality. My colleague Kudri Abbots brought this clip to my attention, and I would like to publicly thank him for that. People really do help each other a lot, and I, in particular, have benefited from this. Another colleague of mine, Bulatov, who is fluent in English and a persistent man, managed to get in touch with Phil Palacia in 2010. This is a photo of Phil from that time. He spoke with him and found out the following. Phil told him that the speed of filming and playback in the video was not altered and reflects what actually happened. The launch of Apollo was filmed and shown without any cuts. The rocket never leaves the frame, as we will see. And although we trust the author, we additionally verified that the speed was indeed consistent. You can hear his voice in the background of the clip. We won't listen to it now. I want to introduce you to his audio commentary, so that you understand that this is someone who worked extensively on NASA contracts and sincerely believes in the moon landings. From this perspective, his material is especially interesting to us, as it is objective. There's PFP with his friend Joe Bunker. Phil himself is on the left, young and slim. Joe was the manager of the ALSEP package, one of the experiment packages that we left on the moon. He and I were the ones selected to go there. Joe and I were fortunate enough to get right next to the rope. It was probably about a mile away from the actual launch site. So, it was quite a nice view, and it gave me some interesting perspective that you normally don't get on television. 3, 2, 1, in mission. Lift off of Apollo 11, the first man landing on the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and so on. His enthusiastic commentary. So, we'll sit back and just watch this. It's spectacular. Let's watch this clip. First, we'll get familiar with it through still frames. I want to draw your attention to the key points to focus on, in the clip. The left frame shows the rocket's ignition. Ignition doesn't yet mean, we're off. We're off, is when the rocket starts moving. 
The second frame shows the ascent. The three digit numbers are the clips timer. The ascent occurs at the moment highlighted in yellow green. I've taken this as zero seconds of flight time. After that, the flight time is shown with white numbers. I remind you that an amateur film clip lasts 3 minutes, up to 173 seconds. The film run out after that. An exclamation mark highlights a very important moment, which allows us to confirm that Phil's clip strictly adheres to the timeline. It's the staging, as NASA classifies it. The stage separates from the rocket. According to NASA's schedule, this should happen at the 162nd second, and it happens exactly at that second in Phil's clip. So, everything is in order. I'd like to note that film expert Kono Volov conducted an independent analysis of this video. He examined both the phenomenon I mentioned and also reviewed the entire clip frame by frame. He came to the same conclusion. The video is authentic and can be used for studying the rocket's flight. So, let's watch the clip itself. Will we be watching all three minutes of the clip? Yes, it's a very important video, dear host. Let's watch the whole clip. There are no cuts in it, and Phil couldn't have made any. But the important thing is that the rocket remains in view the entire time. So, Alexander Ivanovich, let's try to highlight the key moments. The first thing we see, is that this clip has no cuts, edits, or pauses, and throughout three minutes, the rocket never leaves the field of view. During this time, we'll observe the rocket's movement from zero seconds on your proposed timeline up to 173 seconds. Two moments are especially critical for us, the 107th second of flight, when the rocket casts the shadow, and the 162nd second, when the first stage separates. Is that correct? Yes, particularly the moment it passes through the cloud, which is around the 107th second. I've already talked about the 162nd second, so I won't dwell on that. Let's watch. The 107th second, meaning on this timer it will be 1 minute and 40 seconds. Right? 1 minute and 40 seconds. We have 20 seconds left until 140. 17 seconds left. According to your assumption, we should see the shadow, correct? Yes, thanks to a colleague. He added an additional timer accurate to hundreds of a second. The shadow appeared, moved away, and the hole formed. We saw the main phenomenon. Let's watch for another minute or so and then move on to our further analysis. The rocket passed through the cloud layer, and through this haze, we can see its plume. The rocket itself is no longer visible, but its position and movement are clearly indicated by this plume. Apparently, the rocket is entering an inversion layer, where airplanes leave trails. Now, something on the right is starting to emerge, stretching into a cloud, and a fragment separates. According to NASA documents, this is the second stage. This is where the film and the clip will end. Thank you. So, the first thing I want to say, is why we are not using NASA's video. Everyone saw the hole in the video, but at what exact moment did it appear? 
In the NASA video, you can't say, but here we can. To put it briefly, here are three frames, one after the other. We can see that on the left, the plume is approaching the cloud layer, which is still undisturbed. On the right, we clearly see the hole and the distinct shadow moving to the left. Second by second, 105th, 106th, and 107th. What is in the center can be taken as the time when the rocket passed through the cloud layer. So, the rocket passed through the cloud layer at the 106th second. This is important to us because we will use this moment to analyze NASA's official data. Now, the next frame. I am comparing these frames. On the left is what we saw in NASA's footage, and on the right is what we see in Phil Polish's clip. Overall, the information matches with some nuances. The camera positions are slightly different, and some details differ. But otherwise, everything is the same, except for one important detail. On the right, we know the exact time of the event, 107 seconds, but on the left, we do not. From now on, I will rely only on Phil Polish's clip. At what altitude does the passage through the hole occur? We will use the clouds as a height reference. This is why they are important to us. If the sky were clear, the rocket would seem to hang in the sky without any height markers. But the clouds help us, especially high ones. They are fairly consistent, are at about the same altitude, and are quite stable. First, let's look at some photos and recall what we have seen many times. We haven't been to Cape Canaveral, but let's look at this photo above NASA's launch site. The very one from which Apollo 11 launched. Usually, planes fly at an altitude of 10 kilometers. Below, you can see cirrhic cumulus clouds scattered like little sheep. These belong to the so-called upper cloud layer. The term, upper layer, itself suggests that above them, there are likely no more clouds. And indeed, above them, there is only clear sky. The beautiful white line is the launch of the American Space Shuttle. November. It's also important for us that in different months and years, the highest clouds remain at roughly the same level over the launch site with high accuracy. The next scene is one many of you may have observed from the window of a commercial jet, if you weren't sleeping at the time, which is also logical and understandable. As far as the horizon, we can see that all the clouds are below, with only clear sky above. By the way, the passenger address system announces the flight altitude. Our plane is flying at an altitude of Usually they say, 9 to 10 kilometers. That means the clouds are below this mark. And what's higher? Let's take a look. Maybe there are some super clouds up there? No, this is a photograph of the American strategic bomber B-52. There's a plane suspended under its wing. This is an unusual photo, so let me explain. It's an experimental NASA aircraft. We can see that the sky has darkened, and all the clouds are far below. So, what's even higher? According to NASA, at 107 seconds, the rocket will be flying at tens of kilometers in altitude. We have a photo from an altitude of 36 kilometers. Essentially, the air isn't visible, only the stratospheric balloon can sense it. The blackness of space. So, all the clouds are below. Let's go back to the launch site. We see small white clouds lower down, but otherwise, 90% of the sky is covered by a cloudy haze. There's a weather report. This is data from NASA's weather report. 
I will be using NASA's weather data, including cloud coverage for all Apollo launches. Including the famous 11th? Including the famous 11th launch. The upper cloud layer is made up of thin, partially transparent cirrus clouds. This is just as the Apollo 11 rocket was launching. About the altitude of cirrus clouds. There are three types, and they transition into one another. We've all likely seen them before. On the left, light cirrus clouds, classic cirrus. In the center, cirrocumulus. On the right, cirrostratus. We are most interested in the last type. They are noted in NASA's report. Cirrostratus clouds, but their altitude isn't listed in this report. Perhaps because, as you saw for yourself, the cloud cover was practically just a haze. It didn't interfere with the mission, so this data wasn't noted. However, we can verify that these clouds, in various years and months, are consistently at nearly the same altitude above the launch site. The yellow rectangles are data from NASA's weather report. In July 1971, at the launch of Apollo 15, these clouds were at an altitude of 7.5 kilometers. In December 1972, Apollo 17, at 7.8 kilometers. In April 1970, Apollo 13, at 7.8 kilometers. So, these phenomena are quite stable. For Apollo 11, I've taken the average altitude of 7.7 .7 kilometers. So, we know that the upper edge of the cloud layer is at an altitude of 7.7 .7 kilometers. The rocket passes through this layer at the 106th second. This means that at the 106th second, the rocket's altitude is 7.7 .7 kilometers. Now, let's compare that with NASA's data. What altitude does NASA report? Do they have it? Yes, they do, and it's quite extensive. Hundreds of pages of tables, graphs, and thousands of numbers. Here is the cover page of a report by Boeing, one of America's leading aerospace companies. Work conducted under contract with NASA. The trajectory of AS-506. AS-506 is the code name for Apollo 11. The report was released on October 6, 1969. So, the report was made in October, and Apollo flew in July. The report, and this is also important, is called, the Apollo-Saturn V post-flight trajectory. This means, Apollo 11 flew, sent data to NASA, Boeing processed it all, and presented this grand report. Let's take a look. Here is one of the tables from this report. On the left, the first three numbers show the flight altitude, with various projections, vertical, horizontal, deviations to the right or left, and further along is the flight speed. We also see the 106th second, highlighted in a box. It's important to note, and the report's authors also consider it important, that this table uses the metric system rather than the usual American feet. So, we'll be working in meters, which we're familiar with. I don't intend to burden you with the full report, here's an excerpt. At the 106th second, the flight altitude is 24,554 meters. As an experimental physicist, I know that experiments without theory are pointless. Just as theory without experiments is. 
But we, experimentalists and theorists watch each other closely, and of course, we don't miss anything that's off. Stating an altitude with meter level precision for a massive object 100 meters tall, moving at about 1 kilometer per second according to NASA's reports, is simply impossible. That means by the time you say, one, it's already flown another kilometer. And such precision isn't needed, no one cares about this level of accuracy. It shows that this precision is simply calculated. If you divide one by three, you get an infinite number of decimal places. Let's remember that according to NASA, not that I necessarily believe them, but we need to be consistent within one report. The rocket is traveling at one kilometer per second. That means it covers one meter in one thousandth of a second. But then provide the time with that same level of precision, not just to the second. In short, this is a theoretical report, not an experiment. I think my colleague agrees with me. But we take the main point from it. Of course, we round that absurdly precise number to 24.5 kilometers, which is a reasonable margin of error, and say that according to NASA's data, at the 106th second, the rocket should be flying at 24.5 kilometers, while it's actually just piercing through the clouds. So, the flight speed is exaggerated. It's easy to divide 24.5 by 7.7, .7, that gives you about 3, 3.1 or 3.05. NASA overestimated the rocket's altitude by three times. Please, hold on, could you show the previous slide again? Let's make it clear once more, that these are NASA's official data, and they haven't been revised since 1969. Are they publicly available and can be verified? When something's amiss, NASA documents tend to disappear. As far as I know, they are currently publicly available. If that changes, we have our own backup and secure website where full copies of this report are stored. Please show the next slide. I'll admit, in preparing for this program, I verified what is being discussed here. I found this report in the public domain and can confirm that the report referenced does indeed have two different appendices, one for the metric system and one for the imperial system, and the figures are completely different. So, it's impossible to mistake 24,000 feet for 24,000 meters, because in feet, the number is entirely different. These are reliable data, and I wanted to highlight that for our viewers. Thank you. So, the data was inflated by a factor of three. I'd still like to add a little emotion, which I'm not immune to either. Look at the black sky at 15 kilometers, the black sky at 36 kilometers. I don't have a photo from 25 kilometers, but I think you'll all agree and believe that between 36 and 15 kilometers, there's no blue layer of atmosphere. It's black sky there too, while the Apollo 11 rocket is floundering in the clouds. This absolutely contradicts the facts. In general, I've covered the part concerning the altitude of the Saturn V, Apollo 11 rocket. To summarize, the 106th second, 7.7 .7 kilometers. But it's worth mentioning our moon rocket. It's often called a failure. That's misinformation. On its fourth test flight, the first and most crucial stage worked 95% of the required time. Yes, it was a failure, but failures vary. If you left your house for the countryside and your car broke down immediately, that's one type of failure. 
But if you almost reached your destination and had some bad luck, neighbors could help out. During its fourth test, this rocket worked for 106 seconds instead of the required 113. By the way, the rocket was enormous too. It was the only one of its kind, standing 109 meters tall. I live in a 17-story building, which is 34 meters high. A 100-meter tall rocket is like a 55-story building. Almost 3,000 tons of weight. The famous Soyuz rockets weighed 10 times less. You can see people moving at the base on the left. On the right, I've zoomed in on the base. See how massive this rocket is. The base's diameter is 17 meters. By the way, the dimensions are quite similar, 100 meters for the Americans, and slightly more for us. So, the geometric dimensions are determined by the technical requirements and mission parameters. Both had to be comparable for moonshots, right? Yes. And what does that mean? If they are comparable, can we determine the Americans' approximate parameters based on our flight data? Of course. The Americans can't report a different height for the rocket. It wouldn't work unless they made it thicker. Just divide it into three parts, and instead of stacking them, arrange them like we did with the Proton rocket. Have you seen it? Or especially the Energia rocket, a real chubby with side stages added. If you're planning to fly to the moon, be ready to launch a 3,000-ton rocket. This is such a colossal rocket, and it wasn't cancelled due to failure. I can tell you that we launched Sputnik on October 4th. The R-7 rocket that launched Sputnik had three failed tests before that. This massive rocket had four failed tests. Six were planned. Why it was stopped is another topic. This is the N-1 rocket in flight. The photo was taken from an aircraft. I've only talked about the time. It worked for 107 seconds and reached 40 kilometers in altitude. This giant weighed 3,000 tons and burned through 2,000 tons of fuel. Now look at what altitude Apollo 11 was floundering at in the same amount of time. I rounded 7.7 .7 to 8, so it was 5 times lower. Not 5%, but 5 times. Yes, it's 5 times lower. Where is flying the real moon rocket? Above, of course. The question arises, is the Saturn V Apollo 11 rocket capable of reaching the moon? To answer this, we need to determine the rocket's speed. We already know the rocket's altitude, and now we need the speed. It's no secret, everyone knows the formula 1 half mv squared. We'll use this formula to estimate the rocket's energy potential. Once we know the speed, we can calculate the rocket's energy capability. Again, I want to emphasize that all of this is made possible by Polish's video, which is why we are watching this episode. Once again, thanks to colleague Kono Volov, who provided the time down to hundreds of a second. The shadow disappeared, and the clip is now ending. We've seen the main phenomenon. It was quick, but we have accuracy down to hundreds of a second. Please stop it, thank you. When we first watched the clip, we had neither the time nor the altitude. Now we have both parameters. Next, about determining the speed. Essentially, you're looking at a familiar image. 
Once again, the rocket is hovering above the clouds, passed through, made a hole, and cast a shadow. I've only drawn two positions of the rocket. In the lower position, it cast the shadow, which is on the right. In the upper position, the shadow is on the left. If the rocket moves by one body length, by how many of its lengths does the shadow move? Can anyone tell me? The same, by its own length. Actually, it could be longer. Remember how long the shadow of the atlas was? This is the result of the oblique angle of the light rays. The rocket moves two body lengths, and the shadow moves two its lengths. Let's use this as our method. Here are two frames. I've rounded the time, hundredths of a second aren't needed here. The left frame is at 107.2 seconds. The right frame is at 108.6 seconds. I'm showing these specifically because soon these frames will be filled with markings, making them harder to see. Here are those markings. What do we see here? I've used different colors to make it easier to focus. We measure the position of the objects on the screen in millimeters, you could use centimeters, feet, doesn't matter. The main thing is to figure out the proportions. Exactly, the key is to use the same units. I'm measuring in millimeters. The length of the shadow is the same, 21 millimeters. I anticipate some skepticism, so I'll pause briefly. Of course, this isn't like looking at a matte slide, where we could clearly see everything. These are clouds, which are quite uneven, and the shadow bends and shifts slightly. In this case, statistical methods help. I'm showing one frame, but in reality, I took dozens of measurements from this scene. By looking at different positions, which I did, all these random factors are filtered out, and stable values are obtained. So, the length of the shadow is 21 millimeters, and we measure its shift from the center of the hole, not from the rocket itself, since it's moving. On the left, it shifted by 23 millimeters from the hole, and on the right by 57, so the difference is 34 millimeters. The shadow is 21 millimeters long, and it moved by 1.6 of its own length. Therefore, the rocket ascended by 1.6 of its own length. And we know the height of the rocket's body, 100 meters. I'm calculating this without the launch escape system, which looks like a thin needle unlikely to cast the shadow. So, the rocket traveled 160 meters, and the time between frames is 1.4 seconds. We divide the distance by time and get 115 meters per second. At such a slow speed, even some airplanes wouldn't be able to maintain flight. The planes we travel on, fly almost at the speed of sound, subsonic, but close, around 250 meters per second. This rocket is flying slower than an airplane. What can this lead to? First of all, what does NASA say? In the same report, without any special explanations, there's a table, time and speed. The frames were taken at 107 and 109 seconds. Naturally, during that time, the speed changes slightly. Let's take the average, since it doesn't change much. At 108 seconds, the speed is 922 meters per second, almost 1 kilometer per second. According to NASA, this rocket is flying at 922 meters per second. But we found that it's flying at 115 meters per second. Divide one by the other, and we get eight. NASA exaggerated the flight speed of the Apollo 11 rocket by eight times. Now, I apologize, but this next frame will be difficult. We're approaching the conclusions. 
The conclusion is this. The rocket is eight times weaker than what NASA reported. So, at this moment of the flight, the moon rocket, what I've called the theoretical moon rocket from Boeing's report, was flying at an altitude of 24.5 kilometers and at a speed of 922 meters per second. But the real rocket was flying at an altitude of 7.7 .7 kilometers and at a speed of 115 meters per second. I always promised not to go beyond basic school level knowledge, and I'm staying true to that. I respect everyone here, but many are involved in different fields. I believe at least half of the audience remembers that the energy of a moving object consists of potential energy, that's MGH, on the left, and kinetic energy. A woman is nodding in agreement with me. Let's plug in these numbers. I won't make you all recalculate it, but if you do, we find that the energy accumulated by the real Apollo 11 rocket at the 107th second is one-eighth of the energy of the theoretical moon rocket described by NASA in the Boeing report. The Apollo 11 rocket is a weak rocket. And not just weak, but very weak, because the difference is eight times. So, the Saturn V, Apollo 11 wasn't a moon rocket. It only pretended to be one during the staged moon launches. Here, I'd like to respectfully refer to the words of one of the pioneers of investigating the American moon saga. I try to avoid using the word hoax, but it's close to that. Ralph René, an American engineer, inventor, and investigator of the moon hoax, wrote a book called, NASA Mooned America. It was published in Russian in 2009. I must say a few kind words about the translator, Alexander Friedman, because Ralph René's original material was so confusing that if not for Friedman, we wouldn't have this book. And here's what René writes. The immense number of simulations took months to create, and probably more time to carefully edit the simulations and weave them into the fabric of the next Apollo mission. I want to quote my colleague Kono Volov. He said that the films we watched about Apollo 11 were of course, filmed long in advance, because making a movie takes one or two years. I hope I got the numbers right? At least two years before the premiere. So, I continue. Once the simulations were prepared, all that was left, was to provide the distraction that is vital to con man and magician alike, just before the deception begins. In this case it was the public launching at Cape Canaveral that provided all the flame, fury and flash that any magician could ever ask for. It focused the attention of billions of people around the world on the launch while diverting us from the scam. I want to share my own experience. I myself was fascinated for a very long time. It was very difficult to shake off this charm. Other authors and critics helped me. So, the conclusion regarding the topic of my talk about the rocket. Saturn V, Apollo 11, due to an eightfold lack of power, could not have reached the moon. It is very likely it couldn't even reach Earth's orbit. Therefore, Apollo 11 was not a moon rocket, it only imitated one, and flew not to the moon but into the Atlantic Ocean. Naturally, no one would put astronauts into a rocket that would sink, 
so this rocket was unmanned. Alexander Ivanovich, please turn on the slide about the 1 8th power. What is written on the right side? Very interesting, I forgot to mention that. You could also say, well, you calculated it for the 107th second. There is still time to reach Earth's orbit. The rocket first enters orbit, then makes a couple of revolutions around the Earth, and only after that does it perform a translunar injection. It seems there is still time to hit the gas, and everything will be fine, and the rocket will correct everything. You know, it's like when we're driving a car, and if we run out of gas, we have gas stations where we can refuel. Planes can refuel mid-air, we've seen it many times. But there are no gas stations in space. By the 107th second, this rocket had already burned through half of its fuel supply. 60%, if you count only the biggest and thickest first stage, but half of the total fuel supply. You can't step on the gas. This rocket was imitating a moon rocket. Did I answer your question? Yes. So, I think that's the whole story about the rocket. If I haven't tired the audience too much, I would also like to make some general conclusions from this presentation and the meetings we've already had. These will be interconnected things. Of course, this needs to be done. Do you know why this is important? Let's take a look. A shadow, something flickered, something moved, and such conclusions. It won't fly to the moon, etc. In reality, any true picture is revealed by a combination of factors. Something seems off here, something seems off there, and a picture starts to emerge. Let's recall what we've already learned in our previous meetings. I'll try to be as brief as possible. I want to review and summarize. There was a topic called, the color of the moon. On the left is a picture that is especially valuable because it's not from a website where the color could be altered. It's from a printed publication, an original issue of Life magazine from 1969, entirely dedicated to Apollo 11. As stated in the caption, on the windless plane Aldrin saluted the American flag. The color flag makes it quite clear that the flag is planted on a gray plane. And our Zond 7, a month later, flies past that same moon and photographs it and Earth. The moon is brown, orange-brown here, but not green and not gray. The next slide on the same topic. Maybe Apollo 11 just happened to land on a gray part of the moon while the rest is brown? Nothing of the sort. All six Apollo missions planted their flags on some kind of gray plane. Conclusion. This was not filmed on the moon. By the way, on the right is the brown moon, thanks to my colleague Andrei Kudryavits, who photographed it from his window, which you can do as well. I can suggest the right exposure settings if you need help. The next topic we touched on was the energetic Apollo crew. July 1975. Our spacecraft with two cosmonauts stayed in orbit for six days. The cosmonauts were carried out on stretchers. In zero-g and the immobility of a cramped spacecraft, the body quickly deteriorates. Here's a very recent image, which we also saw at our meeting. May of this year, after nine-day mission, the U.S. Axiom-2 spacecraft returned. You can see that the astronaut is being pulled out of the spacecraft, not exactly looking full of energy. But here are the Apollo astronauts, looking lively. October 1968, Apollo 7. These astronauts supposedly spent 11 days in low Earth orbit. 
The conclusion is obvious. They were not in space. And speaking of the moon, here are the energetic ones from Apollo 8. They supposedly were the first in human history to orbit the moon. That also took them six days. These lively ones weren't in space either. We see this scene an hour after splashdown. Clean shaven and looking handsome. Our last meeting was about the connection between the space shuttle and the Apollo missions. I want to draw your attention to one fact that is rarely discussed. When the moon missions ended, for nine years the Americans had no independent space missions. I emphasize independent, because there is one mission that we will discuss separately. This is the Apollo-Soyuz mission. When two spacecraft are flying, I can always launch one, and say the second one was there too. You can probably guess which spacecraft I'm referring to, when I say it wasn't there. But that's a separate issue, it's something I owe you an explanation on. For nine years, the Americans lost interest in manned missions, and only returned to them in 1981. Do you remember how in childhood, when kids lie, they often make mistakes, but they are usually sincere? If something doesn't work out for them, they say, I didn't want it anyway. The same thing is here. What's the simple answer? They didn't have anything to fly on, and for nine years, they didn't fly on anything. Then, on April 12, 1981, the space shuttle Columbia launched. This marked the beginning of the U.S. manned space flights. But later, the shuttles ran their course. I explained in detail why. The important thing is that once again, the Americans were left empty-handed. For nine years, they could only reach space on our Soyuz spacecraft. And they didn't even mention the Apollos. There was nothing to remember. They knew what the Apollo missions were worth. This was from 2011 to 2020. Here's my colleague, Space Corporation Energia employee Alexander Moskalenko, holding in his right hand the launch key for the Soyuz spacecraft. This little key opened the road to space for the Americans. By the way, many may say, what are you talking about? In April, we launched Yuri Gagarin, and already in May, the Americans launched their astronaut, or as they call them, astronaut Alan Shepard. Didn't that flight happen? For that, I've shown you this picture. As the old saying goes, they are two totally different things. What was Gagarin's mission? Gagarin orbited the Earth, traveling 40,000 kilometers. On the left is a portrait of Alan Shepard. Not because I have anything against Alan Shepard personally, but if we're talking proportionally to accomplishments, I should have made this portrait 10 times smaller because Alan flew 400 kilometers and only reached a height of just over 100 kilometers. Gagarin's orbit was at an altitude of 200 kilometers. This is, pardon me, like jumping a little next to a tall mountain and saying, we've been plowing, we flew too. So, it's as different as chalk and cheese, like comparing a gift from God and scrambled eggs. Can anyone see where Alan Shepard's flight path is on this diagram? Do you notice it? Esteemed host, could you show us with your wise cursor? Let me try to show it with the cursor. Here's my cursor. Here's the flag of the United States. I understand this is the landing spot. And here, at Cape Canaveral, they had the launch, and this is the path that corresponds to Alan Shepard's flight. This arc shows the flight altitude, and he flew from Florida to Cuba. And in red, accordingly, is the path of Vostok. Now I want to share my understanding. 
I always emphasize that this is for your judgment. Please write your feedback. I read them very carefully. I will have a suggestion for the hosts regarding the feedback. Maybe it's worth dedicating some time to answering some of them. The chronology of American manned space flight, based on established facts. Because, very often, people say, but they're Americans. They have the Saturn V rocket, they have the shuttles. They overshadowed everything. In light of what we've learned, let's take a look. Orange means there's no manned space program. Green means there is one. The colors are muted so the text is visible. So, from the end of 1968 to the very beginning of 1973, for four years, the moon race takes place. The U.S. successfully simulates the reality of the Apollo-Saturn manned complex. The U.S. is declared the winner of the moon race. 1973 to 1981, nine years. Here, forgive me, I took some liberties. I wrote, the main thing for a fraudster is to know when to fold them. The active part of the moon hoax ends. The Apollos and Saturns are sent to museums. Since then, that's the only place you can see them. The US independently doesn't simulate any manned missions. A bit of a diplomatic phrase, independently. I'm referring once again to the Apollo-Soyuz mission, we'll discuss that later. 1981 to 2011, 30 years. This, in my opinion, is the beginning of US manned astronautics, the shuttles. On April 12, 1981, the first real US manned flight took place, the shuttle Columbia. Over 30 years, each shuttle makes on average, one flight a year. Let me remind you, it was called a reusable spacecraft. The next nine-year period I call NASA's horseless period. The shuttles are retired, and the US has no other spacecraft. NASA astronauts fly to the ISS on our Soyuz. The US is working, I'd say feverishly, to create its first manned spacecraft capsule. They work on it for nine years. It's difficult for them, for a simple reason, they've never built such a craft before. And finally, US manned missions resume. In May 2020, the US once again has its own manned space program. The Crew Dragon spacecraft begins flights. Conclusion First, from April 12, 1961, to April 12, 1981, U.S. manned astronautics lagged behind the Soviet Union by 20 years. Second, if you add up the green years, it turns out that the total duration of U.S. manned spaceflight is 33 years. And I believe we recently celebrated 60 years since Gagarin's flight. Third, all real U.S. manned flights are orbital. With that, I'd like to thank the dear and respected listeners. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Alexander Ivanovich. We should give a round of applause to the speaker. Thank you. If there are any questions from the audience, we will now pass the microphone. First of all, I have one comment and one question. It's clear to me that the Americans didn't go to the moon. There are radioactive belts around the Earth, and if they had gone there, they would have all died. 
Second, in your book, you write that Soviet astronomers observed some kind of squiggle on their screens, not a spacecraft. But I couldn't find the answer to the most important question. Why didn't the Soviet Union use this American moon hoax in its propaganda? The American what? The American moon hoax. Why didn't the Soviet Union expose it? Thank you. I didn't even know, actually, not just me, but all Soviet people didn't know that the Americans didn't go to the moon. Until the perestroika period, this question wasn't even raised. They did go, and that's it. So, was it a conspiracy? So, first of all, no, it's easiest for me to answer the second question. I'll start with that part. First of all, I respect the Soviet Union and its achievements greatly, but I don't speak on its behalf. I'm a small part of the Soviet Union. I can't say why. Let's put it this way. I don't know the answer. I'd be happy to share my opinion on why the Soviet Union went along with this. But that's a separate topic, okay. It's an important question. The answer shouldn't be unfounded or baseless. You've raised a crucial question. I want to tell you one thing. You need to be equal to a question. If I or some other colleagues started by explaining why the Soviet Union didn't expose this, I think it's very likely that no one would even listen. They'd say, listen, we all know the Americans went to the moon. What are you talking about? So, the first thing I'm telling you, are the facts that lead us to the conclusion that the Americans didn't go there. And second, regarding radiation. Quite recently, thanks to the help of my colleague Yupatov, I became acquainted with the work of a graduate of our Moscow Engineering Physics Institute, specifically on radiation and its danger for spaceflight. He's not here today, but maybe he'll hear me. I listened to the recording of his presentation. I'm sure the presenter was a specialist with deep knowledge of the subject. But he used NASA's data. If I ask a shopkeeper, is your beer fresh? What will he say? He'll say, fresh. If I ask NASA, tell me, please, is the radiation there dangerous for Apollo astronauts? NASA will say, of course not. Maybe our domestic colleagues know different figures. In that case, let them provide their own measurements. So, unfortunately, the radiation issue remains unresolved. We don't have our own independent sources. Once again, I'd like to say, dear listeners, if I didn't fully answer any of your questions, Keep in mind that after our meeting I carefully analyze both your questions and your answers. I'll try to respond more thoroughly in the future. I'm listening to you. Alexander Ivanovich, we've already heard about NASA's sources today. Thank you. Please, your question. Hello, Alexander Ivanovich. If Yuri Muhin sowed doubts in me about the reality of this event, your book completely convinced me that this event indeed did not happen. I'm very glad. But when I started offering this book to my acquaintances, mostly scientific staff, PhD and doctors of science, educated people, I found that many didn't accept this information, they didn't believe it. They believe in the digital images shown on the computer. So, I decided to present this problem as a task. I posted these materials on my live journal page under the title, Saturn V Flight Analysis. 
Everyone can take a look there. I'm very grateful to you for this. You're doing a great work. This is ideological work that's equal to the front line in Ukraine right now, and maybe even more. But one remark. You measured the speed of the shadow, and the speed of the rocket equals the speed of the shadow multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the position of the sun and the horizon. So, the actual speed is just twice as high. The question is valid. It's related to a flaw in the diagram I presented. There, the rays go at a 45-degree angle, and the length of the rocket is equal to the length of the shadow. That's not the case. In reality, the speed of the rocket isn't equal to the speed of the shadow. I didn't measure the speed of the shadow. Pay attention, I told you clearly. If the shadow moves two of its own lengths, the rocket also moves two of its lengths. But the length of the shadow could be half a kilometer, while the length of the rocket is 100 meters. Imagine yourself as a shadow at sunset, a long, long shadow. You raise your hand, and the shadow raises its hand too. You move, say, the length of your height, 1.6 meters, while the shadow moves its own length, say 100 meters. The speed of the shadow's movement is much greater. We're not measuring the speed of the shadow. We're measuring how many of its lengths it shifts. Pay attention to this point. Right before the presentation, I realized my purely methodological mistake in the diagram. I need to revise it so that the length of the shadow isn't equal to the length of the rocket. Either the rays should fall at a very steep angle or at a very shallow one. In both cases, the method works. Alexander Ivanovich, does that mean we'll have to meet with you at least one more time? With pleasure. If the audience is interested, we will certainly try to arrange that. Are there any more questions? If not, I suggest we give a round of applause to the speaker. After all, he's working hard. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to the channel. We'll wrap up here. Thank you. Goodbye.